um, hi guys welcome to today's mcq discussion mcq discussion 2 let's get to it yeah so the first question for today is uh, a neonate was found to have periventricular calcifications on ct brain the best method for diagnosis of the etiological agent is option a urine examination option b liver biopsy option c blood examination and option d csf examination you can pause your video now start thinking yeah so let's get to it so this is a very indirect question and and you will see a lot of questions like this in neat it's not a direct question it, it isn't uh, what causes periventricular calcifications in in ct brain so that's that's a very direct question so this is a very indirect question so there are there is a way to approach it so divide the question into two parts the first part being Unit was found to have periventricular calcifications on CT brain. So the first question is, what causes periventricular calcifications? And the second part is, diagnosis of the etiological agent is. So now, here is a clue in the question. It says etiological agent. And most of the times, most of the times, etiological agent refers to some virus, bacteria, or some organism of that sort, some pathological organism. It usually refers to and especially in a neonate when etiological agent is in question you should always 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 consider the torch infections right the when etiological agent in a neonate it, when those things come together in a thread you should always consider torch so you know torch toxoplasma t is for toxoplasma o is for others including syphilis uh, chicken pox so this is more important congenital rubella syndrome rubella C for cytomegalovirus and H for HSV. So those are the torch infections. So it's probably one of these. Again, looking back at the question, periventricular calcification. So if you've read in a, a bit of detail, you know that congenital uh, uh, CMV infection presents with intracranial and particularly periventricular calcification. So once more, let's just take a look at the image for a while because image also comes as a question. You can see here all around the ventricles, these are the ventricles and all around them you have some calcifications or so periventricular calcifications and even a few intracranial calcifications are there. So intracranial calcifications and periventricular calcification in particular on CT in a neonate, it is definitely CMV. So now we know the first part of the question is it is CMV. So the etiological agent in question here is CMV. The next part is how do you diagnose CMV? So the answer if you if you got it excellent is urine examination so cmv infection is mainly uh, the the specimens taken for cmv are cord blood urine of the child and saliva so urine cord blood and saliva so the urine and saliva can be used for culturing the cmv virus the cord blood and the saliva can be used for the uh, pcr test which is the standard and, and the gold standard in this case gives a definitive answer so let's just uh, go through the answer in a little more detail so periventric so we know it is cmv which causes periventricular calcifications so periventricular calcification is of cmv our diagnosis is made by culture of urine and saliva or pcr test of saliva or, or cord blood so saliva or cord blood can be used for pcr test so these are the ways of diag diagnosing cmv Few clinical features of congenital CMV syndrome, IUGR, very important, intrauterine growth retardation, so it's a small baby in general. Jaundice can be present. Now, three things come together here. So, thrombocytopenia, that means the platelets are low, purpura, and blueberry muffin rash. So, what are these things? So, thrombocytopenia, obviously, platelets are low, which leads to purpura, which gives a rash-like appearance, which is called blueberry muffin rash. Okay, so you can see I've added a photo here. Again, it can come as a question. Neonate with this kind of rash. Looks like blueberries on a muffin. So this is called blueberry muffin rash. So other than that, microcephaly, baby small, head is also small. Intracranial calcifications, that was part of our question. Periventricular calcification. And SNHL, sensory neural hearing loss. How do you manage it? Gansey clovid is given. Okay, that's, uh, it's an antiviral drug. Basically, uh, it is an, a nucleoside analog. It prevents DNA synthesis in the virus. So that is how you treat it. It doesn't really remove all the di disabilities, but to some extent, it improves the developmental course of the child. Lastly, just before we move on to the next question, congenital rubella syndrome is a very commonly asked important topic. Small mnemonic to remember the triad. 
of congenital rubella syndrome is CCD, like cafe coffee day, if you can remember. So the first one is cataract in the eyes, so eyes. Second one is cardiac abnormalities, so heart. And lastly, D for deafness or ear, so CCD, eye, heart and ear. And in the cardiac abnormalities, PDA, patent ductus arteriosus, is the most common. And let me remind you, this is not for CMV. And although CMV, congenital CMV syndrome and congenital rubella syndrome have all these things in common, most of these things, maybe not intracranial confusion, but the rest of the jaundice, thrombocytopenia, microcephaly, etc. These triad of cataract, uh, PDA, cardiac abnormalities and deafness are very specific to congenital rubella syndrome, not CMV. So CMV, perimetry classification, diagnosed by urine routine. I mean, it can be done by urine, saliva or cord blood. So those specimens collected. So that's the first question, CMV, congenital CMV syndrome. Torch infections, very important, high yield topic, go through it. Now, here's a question which looks completely out of the blue. Question number two, looks completely out of the blue, looks very easy and I've just added it for the heck of it. So, which of the following? grows in acidic pH. Very weird. So you have Vibrio cholerae, Lactobacilli, Salmonella and Shigella. I'll give you two seconds. Yeah. So what's important here is one, don't get flustered by random questions like this because the answer is very easy and very much present in the options. If you think a bit. Two, don't just tick whatever comes in your mind first. Okay. So I've seen at, at least in the app I saw a lot of people had selective Vibrio cholerae. So that is wrong. And if you just think a little, you know that lactobacilli produces lactic acid from glucose, right? Which is an acid. So if it produces lactic acid, probably can live in an acidic pH. So therefore, lactobacilli lives in an acidic pH. Simple, easy, okay? Just added it for some relaxation. And to t tell you and to remind you that it's important not to get flustered. Sometimes questions look very weird, but the answers are very obvious. Okay, coming to question number three for today is uh, based on eclampsia. Again, top uh, top question and MGSO4, again, frequently asked question. So, in case of eclampsia, MGSO4 administration must be immediately stopped when? So, when do you stop MGSO4 administration among the four options? So, A, knee jerks are sluggish. B, urine output more than 30 ml per hour. C, respiratory rate more than 14 cycles per minute. D, all of the above. So, few seconds yeah so mgso4 is essentially given in case of eclampsia and for profile access in pre-eclampsia so it's usually given by the most commonly given uh, regimen is a pritchard regimen so all you have to remember here other than the specifics which are already mentioned here is that pritchard includes both an iv and im component both an IV and IM component. So you give MGSO4 intravenously and intramuscularly. Whereas your Zuspan and Sibai, the other two regimens, Zuspan, second most commonly used ones, are only IM regimens. So I'll just limit myself to Pritchard. So you have a loading dose of 4 gram IV, which is given over 3 to 4 minutes, and 10 gram uh, deep IM, again given in the gluteal region. And every 4 hours, you alternate between the uh, buttocks and give IM doses of mgso4 so that is the maintenance dose so the question is when do you stop giving or if you there are some danger signs uh, which tell you to stop so basically you stop when there is magnesium toxicity right you want to stop see the definitive treatment is termination of pregnancy so once that's over the eclampsia itself will settle but when do you stop giving mgso4 and you stop giving mgso4 when you see signs of magnesium toxicity so the answer should be a sign of magnesium toxicity. In this case, knee jerks are sluggish is the answer. So option A is the answer, knee jerks are sluggish. So let's just go through the signs of magnesium toxicity. So the first sign, which was the answer in this case, was loss of deep tendon reflexes. So sluggish knee jerks or loss of knee jerk is a definitive indication to immediately stop the treatment. B is a decreased respiratory rate. If you remember the question, it was increased more than 14 cycles per minute. That's not what happens. In MG toxicity, there is a decreased respiratory rate, decreased urine output of less than 30 ml per hour, question had increased, and chest pain or heart block can lead to arrhythmias. So loss of deep tendon reflexes, reduced respiratory rate more than 12, uh, urine output less than 30 ml per hour, and chest pain. So make sure whenever any patient is taking this uh, MGSO4 therapy, you monitor these four things and that is also a question which of the following is monitored which is not monitored so four things loss of dtr decrease of res respiratory rate 
యూరిన్ అవుట్పుట్ లెస్ దెన్ థర్టీ ఎంఎల్ పర్ అవర్ చెస్ పెయిన్ అండ్ హార్ట్ ప్రాబ్లమ్ హౌ డూ యూ మేనేజ్ దిస్ ఇమీడియట్లీ స్టాప్ ద ఎంజిఎస్ ఓఫో దిస్ ఈజ్ ద మోస్ట్ ఇంపార్టెంట్ స్టెప్ చెక్ ఫర్ సీరమ్ క్రియాట్ అండ్ మెగ్నీషియం వాల్యూ సో విచ్ ఆర్ ద ఇన్వెస్టిగేషన్స్ యూ డూ ఇఫ్ యూ సస్పెక్ట్ ఎంజీ టాక్సిసిటీ సీరమ్ మెగ్నీషియం అండ్ సీరమ్ క్రియేట్ అండ్ టెన్ ఎంజీ క్యాల్షియం గ్లూకోనేట్ ఇస్ గివెన్ ఐవి స్టాప్ టెన్ పర్సెంట్ సొల్యూషన్ ఓకే so let's go to the next question we are running out of time okay a 7 year old boy presents with ecchymosis and petechiae all over the body patient gives history of urti 2 weeks back no other relevant findings platelet count was 12000 and coagulation profile was normal which of the following is false regarding the condition okay a few seconds pause think okay this is a little concept based so think okay so let's get to it right so firstly 7 year old boy ecchymosis and petechiae so let's break down the question so ecchymosis and petechiae means there is mucocutaneous bleeding okay so it's a young boy with mucocutaneous bleeding so some bleeding manifestations are there we don't know what it could be then there is a history of urti two weeks back so let's just keep that in mind we don't know if it's important yet but there is a history of urti two weeks back and no other relevant findings were there okay platelet count is 12000 so platelet count is low platelet count is low coagulation profile is normal so when they say coagulation profile is normal that means your pt aptt and ir are normal which essentially means there is no uh, you know co- coagulation disorders okay so if clotting time and coagulation profile are normal there are no hemophilias and those coagulation disorders so we are essentially thinking of a platelet related disease okay so there is thrombocytopenia with mucocutaneous bleeding manifestation and history of urti so when these three things come together you are mostly thinking of a something related to the platelets and one of the common diseases especially because of the history of urti something we can think of is itp itp that is immune thrombocytic purpura earlier it was called idiopathic because i didn't know the cause but now we know it is immune and there is an immune response destroying the platelets there are antibodies formed against the platelet thus destroying the platelet so immune thrombocytopenia so in this case we know the diagnosis is is an immune thrombocytopenia so it's a case of itp this is picture is very classical so it look it looks like an itp why am i saying itp again because there's a history of uti low platelets and mucocutaneous bleeding disorders nothing else mucocutaneous bleeding is nothing but ecchymosis petechiae maybe epistaxis not mentioned here but anyway so let's look at the options so firstly bone marrow exam shows increased megakaryocytes so remember there in itp there is decreased uh, or di- there is destruction of platelets so when platelets are being destroyed actively the bone marrow has to produce more right so there is a possibility of bone marrow examination showing increased megakaryocytes because the production has to increase when it's being destroyed outside so yes this is uh, correct so the question is what is false so this is not false for sure next bleeding into joints is a common manifestation so this is definitely false so the answer for the question is option b because and this is a very core concept for neat uh, which is frequently to question so let's just discuss it in a little detail so remember any bleeding disease or diseases associated with platelets present with mucocutaneous bleeding that is epistaxis ecchymosis petechiae basically superficial bleeding whereas diseases associated with clotting factors like hemophilia are more of a deep bleeding either bleeding into joints called hematrosis bleeding in deeper vessels in muscles and all that stuff so bleeding into joints is more of a manifestation of a coagulation disease and in coagulation diseases the clotting time is increased and your coagulation profile pt aptt inr are deranged so coagulation profile is deranged clotting time is increased so in this case clotting time is normal so there's nothing to worry about in platelet disease it is the bleeding time that's affected and therefore the bleeding is usually gum bleeding ecchymosis uh, petechiae uh, epistaxis and mainly superficial bleeds so this is the answer so this is false in case so we know it's itp and itp doesn't have this so this is false next thing is c patient will have prolonged bleeding time yes we discussed that platelet diseases there is prolonged bleeding time and lastly peripheral blood spheres normal yeah it looks normal so all this is okay so the answer is b 
uh, bleeding into joints is not seen not seen okay so which is false bleeding into joints is false quickly let's just go through itp very briefly already 15 minutes in so thrombocytopenia is there we discussed it yeah patient had 12000 so it is thrombocytopenia increased myocarcinoids in bone marrow was an option it can be there can be normal also because if the destruction is not too much prolonged bleeding time yes it's there peripheral smear appears normal yeah pt aptt ina normal so it's not a coagulative disease so you don't have hematrosis how does it present again mucocutaneous bleeding always remember platelet diseases superficial bleeding mucocutaneous bleeding okay so how do you manage it in mild to moderate cases most of the times itp is a self limiting thing it it is just there for a bit and it goes away so we can say around 80% of the times itp is self limiting and just disappears uh with time uh if the platelet count is less than 30 with moderate bleeding we can give oral glucocorticosteroids with iv immunoglobulins in case of severe bleeding iv methylprednisolone with iv immunoglobulins and if severe bleeding with life threatening manifestation platelet count is so low there's intracranial bleeding and lot of bleeding in internal organ bleeding then platelet transfusion along with iv uh, methylprednisolone and uh, iv immunoglobulins can be given so that's in brief about uh, itp last uh, topic i wanted to just touch upon is organism which causes uh, fitz hugh curtis syndrome so uh, a chlamydia b neisseria gonorrhea c neisseria meningitis and d both a and b so 5 seconds yeah so the answer here is both a and b so what is fitz hugh curtis syndrome so fitz hugh curtis syndrome is nothing but a, it's a rare complication of a pelvic inflammatory disease pid and pid is most commonly caused by neisseria gonorrhea that is gonorrhea and chlamydia so both of these can lead to this complication fitz hugh curtis syndrome so what happens in fitz hugh curtis syndrome there is perihepatic inflammation the liver capsule or the glycine capsule gets inflamed and adhesions are formed so if you look at this this is the liver this is the wall and these are the adhesions and this is called violin string appearance it looks like violin string so violin string appearance the adhesions have a classical violin string appearance yeah and what are the clinical features of fitz hugh curtis syndrome essentially the same as pid which presents with uh, some mild vaginal discharge or moderate vaginal discharge some pelvic pain cervical motion tenderness mild fever could be there that is the features of pid along with right upper quadrant pain so right upper quadrant pain basically the pain where the liver is because of glycine capsule uh, inflammation there is right upper quadrant pain so right upper quadrant pain in a case of pid means the patient has developed fitz hugh curtis syndrome a rare but frequently asked complication of uh, uh, pid so one more thing i wanted to say was uh, since mgso4 is a frequently asked question and frequently quiz topic its uses are preeclampsia and eclampsia it is used in hypomagnesemia mgso4 okay treatment it is used as an anti arrhythmic agent it is this is very important it's newly uh, or currently being used also in severe cases of acute asthmatic attacks so severe acute asthma attacks they are giving mgso4 it does act as a bronchodilator beyond this it also has some neuroprotective function on neonates and how does it act in uh, case of eclampsia is a controversial thing frequently quizzed again so it has a two uh, pronged approach in uh, eclampsia which are which is established one is that it reduces the ach acetylcholine release at the level of the muscle therefore reduces muscular activity and second thing is it causes cns depression in the central system there is a depression so it prevents that so these were the important topics we touched about the most important thing we discussed was which is frequently quizzed is about itp and in itp we know that platelet related diseases platelet diseases glansman's thrombosthenia if you heard about that we'll have another video discussing this because it's very high yield so all the platelet disorders basically cause mucocutaneous bleeding with prolonged bleeding time and normal clotting time whereas your coagulation diseases like hemophilia they produce prolonged clotting time with the normal bleeding time and they present with bleeding into joints and muscles so deep bleeding like hematrosis and uh, one second yeah hematrosis and also hematomas being formed so bleeding into the muscles and stuff so that that's it for today crossed uh, 
uh, the 15 minute mark but uh, hope it was helpful thank you